As a part of my master's in data science from Regis University, I devoted this eight week semester to doing a deep learning project with my custom computer for identifying building footprints in satellite aerial imagery. Hope you enjoy. As satellite imagery has improved over the years, applications of aerial images have dramatically increased. From crop yield to war devastation, these images can tell a detailed story, even from a single snapshot. Buildings are perhaps the most common landscape feature in these aerial tiles. So, jumping into this project, I want to outline it using six steps here. I'm going to go through the entire data science process that I um, had from the beginning of the eight weeks to the end, starting with the problem, moving into the data, pre-processing, some visualizations um, of the data, and then modeling with a fully convolutional neural network, and then the results, and even deploying it to production like API. So, talking about some of the motivation behind this project, um, there was a couple of things that really stand out here. So I really wanted to employ some aerial imagery, doing some more computer vision stuff um, to really improve user workflows in applications. So with my background in software engineering for the company I work for now, uh, we have some work-related applications that would be able to use a system like this that can predict buildings based on satellite imagery. Um, some generic applications here might be uh, determining roof area or t taking this aerial imagery and integrating it into a 2 or 3D CAD system. It's also interested in trying out a semantic uh, fully convolutional neural network uh, like a UNet, which is what I used in this case. Um, I've heard a lot about them and wanted to give it a try. Also wanted to be able to perform uh, multi-GPU training in a custom build that I put together. Um, as you'll see later, I did some uh, liquid cooling, which I added this semester. And perhaps most importantly, I wanted to build the entire data science pipeline from inception to production. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce you to the data. So the data comes from a challenge started last year called SpaceNet. And SpaceNet has five locations right now. Uh, one of them, and perhaps the, the biggest one for identifying buildings is the Rio de Janeiro area. And from the three band spectrum, which is what I'm using in this case, uh, which is just the visible light, um, there were over 250,000 building annotations. So which covers over 2,500 square kilometers. So they stored this in a, in a simple S3 bucket on Amazon. So you could download it, it's about 3.4 gigs. So you can see sort of the folder directory structure here. As I mentioned for my project, I'm using the three band data which is the, the visible spectrum, so the tiles, um, it would be how you would normally see from like Google Maps API or something else. So 8-band will actually include other uh, spectrum information, but because I'm going to be swapping out for a tile provider like Mapbox API or Google Maps, I wanted to not train on additional data that I wouldn't actually have in production. So this 3-band uh, CSV at the bottom is what is sort of links everything together. You could also do it from the GeoJSON files here, as you can see in the folder structure, but going from the CSV was a bit easier. So this is what the CSV looks like. You got an image ID, which directly corresponds to the file name of the TIFF tile. And you can see also the polygons here. Um, you can also use a, a, the column building ID, which I didn't end up using for my project since I didn't do instance segmentation. So these two columns here, one will correspond to the pixels of the tile. So for where that polygon is in relation to its 409 by 409, I think, pixel dimensions roughly. And then you have the, the geo column here, which corresponds to latitude, longitude. However, the actual tiles themselves include the coordinate information that you need to map it back from the pixels to latitude, longitude, which is what I actually ended up doing here. So I didn't know this, but these are called geo tiffs and you can encode the coordinate information directly in there. So this will tell us the all of the corners, how they correspond to latitude, longitude. So in order to train a, set, a semantic network, you really need to train it on masks. And so these polygons I had to translate at the tile level to uh, white and black pixels. So one being a white pixel and zero being black. So in this case, the white tiles represent the buildings. This was a bit tricky because of the interrupt uh, between Python and C++ in the library called OSGeo or GDAL. And so that also was tricky in the production setup because I needed to make sure that was present at the OS level. Moving into the exploratory data analysis, I was able to convert the latitude longitude polygon um, areas to square footage. And so I could do a little bit of analysis of how big are these buildings usually. 
which would be helpful um, actually in production because with a power provider you can choose a zoom level and so that'll tell you you know if it's supposed to be really zoomed or if zoomed out is is decently appropriate so looking at the data set, you have here um, a significant amount of these are actually in the 1,000 foot square foot or 1,000 square foot range. So 98% of the data is actually in this category in the lower left corner there, extra small buildings. And so I used a logarithmic distribution here to show that. So you can see by looking at the y-axis of these smaller graphs, it dramatically decreases from 10,000 to 800 to 100 to 6. So by the time you get in the um, 30,000 plus category, you're looking at maybe 20 buildings total. So also here in the top right, you see um, loading what the, this well-known text format into an actual polygon. And that's what I used to actually um, rasterize them into the black and white images you saw before. So you can also see the median building size here is 227.48 uh, square feet. And so we're dealing with many buildings in a given tile. So to visualize that, I transform the NumPy arrays into actually this uh, desaturated format and then put this kind of yellow um, colorized layer on top of it for showing the buildings. So the one on the left will show a small building. There's at least one of them in that tile. <clears throat> and then the medium building, which is probably there on the right um, in that center tile. And then the largest building, which takes up almost the entire size of the tile, which I think um, 94,000 square feet is a little over two acres. So very, very large building. Moving to the modeling stage, um, it was really important to me to be able to make this code both um, <clears throat> workable and maintainable. So I have a system, um, as you see here, this is sort of the file structure of my project. So you can see there's a folder devoted to just the API that's going to do translations from latitude longitude uh, to the actual masks and then from the image outputs slicing them into actual polygons because the output of this particular model is going to be a sigmoid activation function. So it's going to go from 0 to 1, so it's going to tell you a probability per pixel, and we have to slice that to actually return polygons back to the user of latitude longitude. So that's going to be devoted to that. The interface here um, with the program um, for training, uh, serving up the API, tuning, exporting, and even doing evaluation is all through the command line interface here. So I have CLI. Um, I also extracted some generic things, group data split, um, and most of the data reading comes in through data.py. I even tried to keep it somewhat separate from Keras specifically if I wanted to swap it out for a different framework like MXNet or PyTorch. So I was able to, to keep that decently separate. And then you also notice a Docker file in here, and that was used for deploying it to production. As I said, setting up GDAL to, to interface from C++ to Python was uh, a bit tricky to do in production. Also, you see here a bunch of unit tests. This is sort of testing the core logic of the, the modeling and ext or extracting the data primarily and making sure that's correct. So as I mentioned, it's accessible primarily through a command line interface. This has help documentation, getting started with this um, to be able to run your own models. So all of the code is open sourced. I've kept back the model, but I'll continue on that a bit later. So through all of this, I uh, have a number of features set up before I even started the modeling process. Everything from batch size to train split, um, you know, shuff, auto shuffling the training, uh, making sure that we can create uh, augmented training examples. So rotating and scaling these tiles such that they um, appear as new examples. So rotating both the input and output at the same exact transformation. Um, also configuring basic parameters from the command line interface multi-GPU training, etc. So as I mentioned, I used a uh, semantic fully convolutional neural network with a sigmoid activation function. I ended up using um, a UNet in this case, and if you're not familiar with UNets, um, essentially they are described thusly because of their shape, as you can see from this image, and sort of a bowl or U-shaped. Um, they're also called auto, or they're also called um, encoder decoder networks because the representation at the bottom of the U is a much smaller, more compact representation of the features from the original input. Now, obviously, this is a, a little bit difficult to, to read, but the text actually corresponds to the image blocks, and you can see there's different blocks of double convolutions and then max pooling, and then I've combined that with some dropout layers. So this network is quite large and actually has 31 million parameters. And I'm sure further work we could reduce that, but I sort of built it up um, 
through the training process. Um, and as I mentioned, I was able to train on multiple GPUs simultaneously. And so that helped along the process. So here's an example of actually training it. Um, so I used the SGD, a stochiastic gradient descent optimizer in this case. I started out with Atom because it'll adjust the learning rate, um, but when it started start simpler and start with SGD, I'm sure further development we could take a look at other optimizers, perhaps that would do better. Um, so you can see here sort of an example of it training through this. Um, I initially used a intersection over union uh, loss function. I tried to write my own, then went to TensorFlow, and then um, eventually switched to an F1 score. Um, the intersection over union was having a bit trouble, and the official SpaceNet score was actually calculated with an F1 score. Now, my, my setup's a little bit different because I'm not using that 8-band imagery, um, but it should be roughly comparable. So also, because this bit me a bit last semester, I wrote a custom visualization here that happens at the end of each epoch, and this is an image from the validation set. And so this describes to me how the network is doing. Now, this is only at a particular slice level. So um, I think this is like a 0.5 slice. So if the pixel is greater than 0.5, it's considered part of a building. So what you're seeing here is the red is where it thought there was a building, but there's actually not and the greens where it got it correct, and then blue is where it missed it. So there was a building and it didn't think it was. So I also used TensorBoard to train through the process. These are some scalar values. Um, as I mentioned, I switched from IOU to uh, F1 score, and that was extremely helpful. Likewise, here's um, the multi-GPU training, as you saw in the intro video. This is sort of the custom liquid cooling that I put in for the data science build. I ended up um, having some very high temperatures, which prompted that to, to actually be set up. Moving on to the results and deployment, um, I got an F1 score of 0.6974, which may not mean a whole lot, but um, it does, there was a sample implementation that was 0.729, and but the, there's a couple of differences. I did a 60-10-20 split, so 60% train. They used both the three band and the eight band imagery and I actually filtered out tiles with no buildings. So a little bit different, but still pretty decent result when compared with that sample. So as I mentioned, we also had to tune tolerance here. So because the pixel values are from zero to one, you have to cut across them at, cer any, at certain threshold. So I wrote a TensorFlow implementation here and chose 0.7 as the default tolerance when serving this API. So for the deployment, I created a full uh, CI-CD pipeline, which stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Deployment. So in other words, the idea here is you can do a single Git push up to, to master on GitHub, and it will both do the unit testing and deploy it to a production environment. I thought it working it was a little bit challenging to use with Docker, uh, but you see here the use of the API. It's got latitude, longitude, and it gives back the GeoJSON polygons. So that's it. Thanks for, thanks for uh, listening. Here are some of the references I have, and uh, please go ahead and check out the article associated with it and the GitHub, which are here. So thanks for listening.